Wonderstruck. I am reading this book to my year five class with permission from Scholastic. Wonderstruck. Dunfant Lake, Minnesota, June 1977. Part one. Something hit Ben Wilson and he opened his eyes. The wolves had been chasing him again and his heart was pounding. He sat up in the dark room and rubbed his arm. He picked up the shoe his cousin had thrown at him and dropped it on the floor. That hurt, Robbie. Robbie muttered a few words. What? Ben asked. What? What? Can't you hear me? Are you deaf? Robbie, along with practically everyone else on Gunflick Lake, knew that Ben had been born deaf in one ear, but he still thought it was funny to ask Ben this all the time, even in the middle of the night. He repeated himself for Ben. I said stop yelling in your sleep. In the corner of the room, Robbie's hunting rifle glinted in the moonlight, piled nearby were his fishing rod, pocket knife, bows, arrows, handmade spears and slingshots of varying sizes. Robbie seemed to go out of his way to collect dangerous things. Ben lay back down on the old cot squeezed between the dresser and the window. The electric fan was broken and both boys were shirtless and sweating in the summer heat. Their blankets were thrown uselessly to the side. Their hair was matted to their foreheads. Ben's hands were shaking from the dream. Ever since the accident, the wolves had appeared, galloping across the moonlit snow. Red tongues wagging and white, teeth glistening. He couldn't figure out why they were stalking him, because he used to love wolves. He and his mum had even seen one once from the front porch of their house. The wolf had looked beautiful and mysterious, like it stepped out of a storybook. Outside, the wind picked up and rustled through the leaves on the giant trees surrounding the house. Voices droned from Robbie's CB radio, which he insisted to stay on all night. It didn't bother Ben that much. Being deaf in one ear had its advantages. He could sleep with his good ear on the pillow to block out all the noise. Ben used a similar trick in school. He'd lean his good ear on his hand when he wanted to tune out his teacher or his classmates. It made it easier to read books about out of space that he hid in his desk. I wish I didn't have to share my room with you anymore, Robbie said, before drifting back to sleep. Ben silently agreed. A familiar noise caught his attention and he puts his good ear against the wall. It's been three months since she died. Jenny, we've got to talk about selling it. Ben knew right away his aunt Jenny and Uncle Steve were talking about his house again. Elaine loved that house, Steve, Aunt Jenny countered. And our grandfather built these houses and the little guest cabin. It's not so easy to sell something as part of our family. Can't we just leave it for now? Ben could picture his aunt tightening her ponytail as she said this, a habit she shared with Robbie's older sister, Janet. His mum had done it as well when she had something serious to say. We're going to have to sell it sooner or later, Uncle Steve said. We can't just sit there and touch forever. We have bills to pay and now we have Ben. You've booked hunting and fishing trips with three lodges for nearly the entire season. I'm, cook I'm cooking at Gunflint Lodge. We'll be fine. Yes, but the money doesn't last all year. Summer's just starting, Steve. Do we really have to worry about this now? A long silence followed. Growing up, Ben had never thought about who owned his house. It had always belonged to him and his mum. But now it seemed as if it was his aunt and uncle's. Why wasn't it still Ben's? Could a kid, could, could a kid even own a house? After the funeral in March, Ben had figured he'd be able to go back into his house whenever he wanted. Considering it was only... 83 steps away from his cousins, but the more time passed, the more afraid he was to walk through the front door again without his mum there to greet him or the, on the other side. There weren't many houses on the lake. His house and his cousin's house were the two closest to one another. Ben missed the cluttered cosiness of his house. The little table, mismatched chairs, old clocks, quotes his mum had carefully clipped and taped to the refrigerator. 
prints her favourite artwork, rusted cogs and wheels and other interesting things. Ben had scavenged on their walks around the lake and in town, their record collection, the stone fireplace, their prized moose antler found along the Gunflint Trail and of course all of their books, which spilled out of the bookcases and were stacked in piles around the house. If his aunt and uncle sold his house, wondered Ben, what would happen to all his stuff? What would happen to his mum's stuff? Who would live there? Maybe he could move all their things to the little guest cabin. When the cousins were little, they used to play there if a visitor wasn't using it. They pretended it was a witch's castle or a pirate ship, even though it was only a hundred yards further down the lake, about miles away from the grown-ups. That all seemed like another lifetime now. The argument between his aunt and uncle had subsided, and the clock down the hall chimed at midnight. Unable to keep his eyes closed, Ben reached beneath his cot for his red plastic flashlight and the wood box he kept hidden there. The box was about the size of his math textbook. It was shiny brown and smooth to the touch. The bottom was covered in soft green felt. On the lid was an engraving of a wolf. One of the artists in town had made it, and Ben's mum had given it to him for Christmas last year. The box, the flashlight, and two suitcases full of his clothes were the only things he had brought with him when he moved into Robbie's room. Ben turned on the flashlight, pulled a key from the pocket of his pants, which lay folded on the floor, and opened a small brass lock on the front of the door. One at a time, he touched the little items inside. He had organised them between cardboard dividers, giving each one a special section. Among other things, he had several oddly shaped twigs. His last baby tooth, a little plastic game piece he found behind the school with his friend Billy, who always teased him for picking up the garbage. A bird skull, a fossil called a stromatolite that he discovered while hiking the ridges near Gunflink Lake. In the bottom right hand corner of the cardboard grid were two small bumpy grey stones. Bane picked up one and turned it into his palm. When he had showed them to his mum, she told him told him that these stones, called ejecta, as well as the entire area where they lived, had been created nearly two billion years ago by a meteorite crash across the lake in Canada. After that, Ben became fascinated by the stars and outer space, so his mum brought him into the library where she worked and showed him all the books about the night sky. Sitting beside her at her big orange desk, his papers and books piled taller than he'd been at the time, he had found a diagram of the Big Dipper which pointed to the North Star. The North Star was the last star in the tail of the Little Dipper, and the book said that the travellers had used this star for centuries to find their way when they were lost. If you are ever lost, his mum said, had said, when he showed her the book, just find the North Star and it will lead you home. His mum smiled and pointed to a bulletin board next to her desk. Unlike the refrigerator at home, it just one quote taped to it. Ben read it out loud. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Because his mum was the town librarian, Ben was used to being surrounded by quotes from books, many of which he didn't fully understand. But this one struck him as particularly strange. He thought about it for a moment, came up with nothing, then said, what does that mean? His mum smiled and shrugged. He was sure she knew exactly what it meant, but she liked him to figure out things for himself. Was it written by an, astron an astronomer? He asked. She shrugged again, but Ben could tell the answer was there, just out of reach behind her eyes. Over the next week, Ben read all the books about stars his mum had found for him, and then convinced her to let him paint his room black. At the general store in town, he bought an armful of glow-in-the-dark stars and covered the walls and ceiling of his room with them. He put the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper and the North Star directly over his bed. His mum surprised him with an old telescope she bought, she bought with the money from her rainy day fund. He placed it right next to his window and gazed through it every night before bed. Once when Billy came over, he looked at all the space stuff and said, Oh, I get it. You're an alien. Ben had laughed along with Billy, but every time he looked through his telescope after that, he had the same thought. I'm an alien. Ben put the bumpy grey stone back in its little compartment. For a moment, he wondered again about the quote and what his mum thought it meant. But it passed out of his mind as he lifted a bird skull from the box. He'd found the skull on one of his weekend walks with his mum on the Gunflink Trail. He ran his fingers over the smooth dome of the head and the sharp point of the beak. His mum had made him research what kind of bird it was, and he found out it was a waxwing. He read all the bird books in his mum's library, and could now identify 23 different species just by looking at their bones. In a book about the birds of Minnesota, he'd come across a reference to the Duluth Museum and their collection of bird skeletons.
Can we go there, Mum? he had asked. It's only four hours away. His mum had tightened a ponytail and said she'd think about it. The more Ben read about the museum's collections, the more he wanted to go to Dulloch. He begged her for months, until one day she said, Is that what you want for your birthday this summer? A trip to Dulloch? Yes, Ben practically jumped into the air. Don't get too excited about it, we'll see. Ben wiped his hand across his eyes, as if he were rubbing away the vision of Dulloch. He put the bird skull back into the box and thought of all the time he'd spent at his mum's library after school, reading up on birds or out of space and doing homework. If only he'd been there the day of the accident instead of sick at home, surely he could have done something to help her. At the very least, he would have been, he would have seen the snow and ice accumulating, accumulating on the road and reminded her to put on her seatbelt. How he wished he could go back in time. Ben took a deep breath and closed his eyes, knowing he'd never go to Dulloch. His aunt and uncle couldn't afford a trip, especially now that they had to take care of him. Even though they loved, he loved them, he didn't feel at home with his aunt and uncle. But where else could he live? He didn't have any other family. His grandparents had died when he was very little, and he'd, know, and he'd never known anything about his dad. The one time he'd hinted around the subject to his mum, she'd tightened her ponytail a few times and then undid it altogether. As her long black hair spilled down around her shoulders, her eyes filled with tears. Ben had never seen his mother cry before, and it startled him, so he didn't ask again. Right afterwards, she had put on her favourite record and played a mysterious song called Space Oddity, about an astronaut named Major Tom who gets lost in space. She used to listen to the song over and over again. With her eyes closed, she placed the palm of her hand against the fabric of the speaker so she could feel it vibrate against her skin. In bed that night, staring up into the glowing stars, glued to his ceiling, Ben had imagined that Major Tom was his father and had found himself wondering, what did he look like? Did he know about Ben? Would he ever come back to Earth? Ben opened his eyes and stared into the small circle of light from the flashlight that illuminated the box on his lap. Ever since his mum died, Major Tom had been on his mind. He liked to pretend that Major Tom arrived in a spaceship behind his cousin's house while his whole family watched. Ben would climb abroad and disappear into the night sky. He knew it was a t childish daydream, but it wouldn't go away. From the box, he picked up a little turtle made of glue together seashells. It felt smooth and cool in his hand. His mum had given it to him when he started third grade. It had been a sort of joke between them. When he was little, she used to call him Turtle because he was so quiet. You know Turtle, she'd say before they left for school. You shouldn't be such a turtle. Remember to stick your neck out. Speak up. Be brave. His mum ran her fingers down his cheek until they touched the underside of his chin. As she lifted his face so their eyes met. Don't be afraid to look people in the eye when they talk to you. Okay? Okay, he said, holding her gaze. That's better. Then held the turtle tightly in his palm and laid the box and flashlight on his cot. He opened the bug screen in the window and leaned out. The air felt thick against his skin. He looked at his home sitting empty through the trees, a mosquito buzzed near his good ear. With his head turned slightly to the right, he could just make out a trucker on Robbie's radio talking about an approaching storm. Ben looked up at the sky. It was growing overcast, but a few stars still twinkled through the gaps between the clouds. He had believed his mother when she told him he'd never be lost as long as he could find the North Star. But now that she was gone, he realised it wasn't true, a mysterious quote from his mum's bulletin board echoed again in his mind. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Hoboken, New Jersey, October 1927. So I just want you to now start thinking, who could this be? What do you think they do? Have you noticed anything about the date? What about the different locations? Again, what do you notice here? Is it what details are there in the picture? What about in the wording? What do you notice? What do you think this character does? Look really closely at these two pages. What do you notice? Is there anything you can see? Anything you can read? Good. 
Then what do you notice about this picture? Who's this character? What relation do you think she has to the woman in the magazine? Where do you think this character is? Do you notice anything else? Are there any other locations? Look really carefully. What's in the background? What do you think this character might like doing? Zoom in a bit. So make sure now that you have the PowerPoint with the questions on and you can answer those in your exercise book. But when you are answering the questions, make sure you are answering them in full sentences. I just want you to think really carefully, what can you see? And really use these pictures to help you answer that question. So this is up to page 39. 